Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us relatively early on a Monday morning um, to talk about AI. So we're going to have you for just over half an hour. We're going to cover um, what does AI look, ni- look like in a production-ready kind of application, um, and hopefully they'll give you a good frame as you navigate the show floor and see, um, you know, beyond the hype cycle of AI, what's actually happening, what can you start implementing today within your workflow. Uh, but before we start, we have three lovely panelists with us today. I'm going to have them quickly introduce themselves. Um, Vani, can you give us a quick intro to start us off? Hi, my name is Vani. My lovely long Indian name is Saraswati. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Dancing Atoms. Uh, it's a boutique studio. We create beautiful films, animation, live action, um, also dwelling into games quite a bit using the same narrative. Um, I'm trying to create a Indian animated film using anime, hopefully this year. So those are the things that I do. So thank you for having me here. <laughs> thank you, Ronnie. Um, Alex and JD are both uh, co-founders, uh, not co-founders, they're both founders as part of the Fabric AI cohort. Um, Fabric is... Uh, we are ourselves a startup and we're aiming to support AI startups uh, in the content production workflow that are using AI in some way or the other. So, Alex, can you t- uh, give an intro and tell us a little bit about what your product is? Absolutely. I'm Alex Porter, CEO of Modtech Labs. At Mod, our focus is on creating um, artistry assistance tools. So for us, it really is uh, creating templatized and easy to use tools that make really challenging things like nerfs and splat and 3D workflow processes uh, easy for anyone to access. So ultimately creating um, solutions for content generation and content optimization. We want to make sure the quality of the content looks great and it plays back well. And we have a quick video to talk about that. Awesome. JD, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're bu- building with Playbook XR? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is JD. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Playbook XR, a 3D design and collaboration platform. We're making it possible for anyone to unleash their creativity without using game engines like Unreal um, with AI augmented tools. Playbook is web-based. It supports cross-platform collaboration, meaning users can design a 3D scene from either the web or from a VR device. Um, and now we'll play a little reel to showcase some of the capabilities of our platform.
Well, great. Okay. So we're already seeing, I think, in both of those examples, kind of a, a range of different ways that AI are being used, right? Um, kind of going beyond maybe the narrative of generative AI to see AI being used kind of in the back end to optimize, AI being used to kind of come alongside the creator and augment the creator, um, to kind of level set how we're going to talk about AI today. Um, we're kind of talking about AI across a couple different dimensions. One is um, efficiencies kind of across the traditional production workflow. Um, this used to be very like machine learning focused. We've already had machine learning efficiencies kind of used often across like post-production, right? There's different ways that we've had uh, machine learning be a part of that, but that's kind of extending now across the, across the life cycle of production. There are more efficiencies and generative is now being an additional component, especially, especially generative text is being a part of like an additional kind of um, element of efficiency within the traditional production process. But going beyond that, we're seeing new kind of categories of production start to emerge. There is one kind of track, which is this vision of generative video, um, and generative video potentially being this end-to-end -end, um, visual pipeline that you could prompt your way through the, through a whole kind of film, through a whole um, visual narrative. Um, there are challenges with actually doing that and making that production ready. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a sec. Um, but another thing we're seeing is traditional production itself has been evolving in the last couple of years to be much more real-time focused, much more 3D focused, much more computational across the whole process of production. Um, and now we're seeing that real-time 3D kind of flow really be augmented in new ways with procedural and generative kind of add-ons along that process, whether that's on the reality capture side of things with NERFs and Gaussian splats, whether that's, um, you know, creating procedural assets, whether that's enabling like generative kind of um, agents within virtual worlds, right? So we'll dig into some more of all these things, but basically we're going to touch on a little bit of like what is happening across each of these, um, each of these elements. But I guess to start with, um, what are we seeing on the generative AI side of things? What are the, what are the challenges you're seeing? How are you kind of working around it? Maybe um, JD, I'll have you start really quickly here to talk about um, what were you seeing as challenges, I guess, around continuity and consistency with generative and how are you thinking about that? Yeah, that's a great question, Rachel. Um, one of the big things that we're seeing, obviously, is Sora that come out um, from OpenAI, the ability to kind of text prompt an entire video that has spatial consistency. The way that we think about it at Playbook is that um, film is going to become more of a 3D problem for spatial consistency rather than an image editing problem. And the way we're tackling that at Playbook specifically is to be able to compose a 3D scene and, um, and use a camera to kind of frame those shots between that, that 3D scene. But one of the bottlenecks for that is what are the assets that you're going to actually compose in your scene, the 3D assets. And that has been a bottleneck within this workflow for a long time. But recently, there's been a lot of research coming out on the 3D generative AI side to generate and basically conjure assets out um, from text. Um, and they're not necessarily production assets, but they're great placeholders to communicate what the scene is going to look like. Um, so that, that's what we're seeing on our side. Yeah, I think I think the interesting thing about working with generative models is that the decisions get collapsed to the level of a 2D frame, right? So usually when you're thinking uh, in a filmmaking, in a TV way, you're thinking spatially, right? You're like, this is the background, this is the foreground, these are the choices in how things move through space. All those decisions now have to happen in a singular prompt that's trying to um, also work with a model that doesn't necessarily have spatial knowledge and spatial understanding because of how generative models are trained, they're also trained with 2D images. They don't necessarily know how um, physics works, how space works. And we're seeing that become better with, for example, Sora has been trained on more spatially aware kind of content. So that's why the the content that we're seeing kind of emerge out of that is definitely more realistic. But that's, that's kind of this learning curve that generative models still have to overcome to really be kind of at a production ready level. Um, but we don't want to just talk about the technical side of things. We want to think about how this is then impacting, I think, the creative process of, like, where does that generative piece come in? Where um, where might it actually be useful? So JD talked a little bit about um, the previous side of things, right? Um, if you're using generative, it's still a great, like, ideation tool. It can be a collaborative partner. Um, Lani, can you talk a bit more about, like, how you – how, how you generally think about the creative process and maybe how that relationship is evolving now that you're collaborating with these AI tools? Um, for me as a writer and a creator, I think one of the biggest challenges that I face is talent. Um, you know, the tools are getting upgraded, updated so quickly 
that how do you find the talent that understands the creative vision and the bigger picture? And with so many tools around, how do you say which is the right tool? By the time I apply a particular tool to a project that I'm working on, it's outdated in six months. So now I have to figure out how do I reinvest my time, my talent, and the people to get up to speed. Um, that is one of the biggest challenges. And I think the other, other thing in terms of integrating, I think it's, it's, I want to use the word fail faster. Uh, in the creative process, it's, it's really amazing the amount of iterations that I can make to decide that's the best thing that I want to choose as a creator. Because at the end of the day, it's all about engagement. It's about finding the audience and finding a connection with your story, whether it's a TikTok video, which is, or, or a YouTube shorts that's hardly 30 seconds to writing a feature film. It's all about story and, and we're all here to serve the script to say. So I feel like these tools are a way to, it's just another tool and, and so many areas in filmmaking from, you know, from pre-production to production to post that each one of these tools is allowing me as a creator to say, great, this is the scene that you want to write and you want to write it this way or you want to film it this way. This is the color that you want to pick for your, you know, so I feel like it's, it's, it's empowering on in many, many ways, but it's a long way to find your tribe, <laughs> to find your people, to be able to produce that content. So one is the tools, the creation of the tools. And the other one is how do you get that team to produce and create and direct what the vision is? So those are the two things that I think have to go hand in hand as we do more of this. Yeah, I think that's a great reminder, right? At the end of the day, this is still humans are part of this process, right? This is about trying to find ways that these tools can augment how we are um, creating and how we're trying to express ourselves. Um, I think you're also mentioning something interesting, which is this dialogue a little bit of this back and forth of, of seeing the output from these tools and it kind of may be changing the way that you might have thought about an idea going into the process. I think a lot of times when I talk to AI filmmakers, um, there's this thing of, I don't necessarily go in with the assumption when I'm working with an AI tool that I'm going to get what is on my script. I go in with a loose idea of what I want and I see what the AI gives me and I respond to that. And I think if you're going around the show floor today, I would keep in a year open to kind of seeing um, ways, maybe not with generative video, but ways that generative, um, generative, uh, content enabled by like LLMs and kind of that, uh, content recognition is, for example, changing editing flows. Um, one thing that's kind of common if you're, if you're going to checking out like booths that are centered around editing and editing flows is now that there's automated tagging of content, now that there's, uh, uh automated transcription that's able to get an understanding of what the clip is, Already when the content comes in, there's an awareness of what the arc of the story could be with based on the footage that you have or what the sentiment of the footage is. And that changes maybe the way that you approach the cut of um, you're not discovering things in the same way. Um, there's some parts that are maybe automated or some parts that are kind of um, changed uh, in terms of how you explore the story that you want to tell, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just the, the modalities are changing and kind of adapting. Um, are you seeing any of that, JD, with like the tools and how you're seeing um, there's, I think within generative content, but also now there's the, there's the way that we were talking about, you know, computationality of the filmmaking process, this real time 3D thing, uh, fix it in pre, that itself is kind of a new modality, right? Of people are approaching the process with let's plan more before we get to set. Um, how are you seeing that evolve? And then Alex, I'm going to have you answer that as well. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. The typical kind of workflow for 3D happens in post typically. You know, you go to after, you go to, um, you, virtual production workflows that are happening in Unreal. And this is oftentimes a single player experience that is very much happening in a black box. Um, and the idea for Playbook is to kind of bring and front load a lot of those decisions that would oftentimes be fixed in post into the pre-production workflow. So tackling all the questions of, should we use, um, this kind of technique right here at this point or this VFX department right now at this early stage, can we do that and front load this, those decisions in playbook at the early stage of your cycle when you're kind of navigating that idea maze, when there's many kind of just critical decisions that will determine what the aesthetic and the budgetary con considerations of your shots are going to be. Um, fr front loading those will basically save you time and money at that stage. Um, 
Absolutely. That is uh, a trend that we're seeing as well. So ModTech Labs tends to sit um, closer to the end of the process. So final look, final pixel, if you will. Um, we worked heavily in virtual production and other sort of VFX medium uh, using real-time technologies and other, you know, 3D content. But what it really uh, boils down to is the fact that you need to have this collaborative effort because it is a creative vision that needs to be executed technically. And so there are so many people that have to have a voice in this process. And the earlier you can get them into the process, the more effective the storytelling element actually can be. Um, what we have done and where we work um, with our tooling is actually on the other side of AI. So we're not generative um, in the sort of traditional sense that most people think of. Where we're actually focusing is using uh, the AI to actually create tools. So we have automated mesh decimation. So that means that your meshes are too heavy and your scene won't play on your virtual production wall. You need to optimize your scene. Um, that's just one example. We have a ton of things that we've built and we've seen a lot of uh, trends in the, in the tooling space to help make these things easier to actually uh, deploy and play back. And uh, you know, we are also seeing this sort of transmedia uh, trend where people don't want to just use the content for virtual production or they don't want to just use it for, uh, you know, an XR uh, experience. They want to also use it for media, uh, for marketing, mobile, you name it. And so those things all have to also be thought out as you're starting from the beginning. How are you going to deploy this in the long run and how can you monetize your content? Yeah. So I think if we're, if we're kind of going back to our high level view, right? With the machine learning, with efficiencies across traditional production, I think you'll see a lot of examples of that across the show floor. That's been happening for a long time. It's going to continue to happen, and it's, it, that process is being now augmented through um, through LLMs, through a lot of this deep learning stuff around tagging, around entity recognition, which is really interesting to see. On the generative side of things, we talked a little bit about um, how it's kind of coming alongside the creative process, um, especially in the ideation stage, but it still has some ways to go to be production ready. Um, I'm going to have us dig a little bit more into this 3D kind of workflow around um, this more computational version of production and where different categories of AI intersect with it, because I think there's a lot there in terms of new modalities of storytelling that are being enabled through that. Um, I think to start with, um, Vani, can you talk a little bit about um, you are really proficient in Unreal. You run a fellowship for Unreal for a focus on, on animation and storyboarding and the creative process. Um, coming from an animation side and now kind of moving into gaming, how are you thinking about that interplay between the different modalities and how they each kind of support the story in a different way? Yeah, um, for the last three years, I've been uh, a partner with Epic Games uh, doing a um, fellowship, uh, especially focused on women all around the world. So last year, we did an amazing um, uh, cohort called the uh, Women Creators Program, 100 uh, gaming professionals, all women from 19 countries and nine different time zones done online. And it was amazing to see how we were able to kind of incorporate a AI in the game conceptualization where they had to, in the first week, pitch their ideas using um, a concept that they all wrote. And in five weeks after the UEF and training, we were supposed to pitch a game trailer. And it was all possible because of the amount of intense understanding of how to take something, which is a simple idea, right around it. Of course, it's a lot of team effort that went in an amazing mentorship and training. But the goal was you have to do these things to enable yourself to put your ideas and creativity out there. Um, so I think it's, it's in, in a way, uh, I'm using the word empowering again because that's the tool is that the budgets are cutting down so much, whether it's in filmmaking. So I want to make an animated feature film and the uh, people come to me and say, make it in $3 million. And I'm like, are you kidding me? How do you expect me to make an animated film in $3 million? But they're like, that's all we can recoup in terms of return of investment because it's going to go direct to TV. And so as a creator, I can step back and say, no, I need 30 million to make my film. Or I take the challenge up and say, how do I produce and write something and create something within the $3 million that I have? So I think um, to answer your question, it's a bit of a situation where 
the market is demanding something and you have to produce something faster, but still of a good quality. And I think this iterative process with AI is going to make things faster. But again, I think as a creator, I have to be completely understanding of what's around me. Yeah. So uh, did I answer your question? No, I think that's great. I think it's definitely about um, how can we, if we're going back to that augmenting piece, right? If you need to work faster, more efficiently, how are these providing the tools for you to get there? Um, I think another piece of that is when you're working with tools like Unreal or UEFN is this question of, um, yes, you could use it for the animation side of things, but is there's this repurposing of those assets that now makes it hopefully less expensive for you to move into the gaming space. Yes. I, I, you know, when she used the word repurpose, so I wrote and directed a short film called dance for it, which is all about a boy falling in love with a girl inside the virtual environment and finding true love. Um, as I was writing that film, I realized that that could actually become a game. And so I've started developing that short, taking the same assets that I've created in 3D and, you know, the world design and the world building that I've spent so much time and energy to now say, how do I take that idea, use those assets and then make it into a game? So when I went to GDC this year, my entire conversation was based on, I have this and the um, the amount of talent that actually is available to use that material and to convert into a game is is much faster. I mean, like I can do it today because I have access to all of it. Uh, maybe five, six years ago, it would not have been that easier. Yeah. And I think there are more tools than ever. I think in, in different ways, Playbook and Mod Tech are focusing on that repurposing and how do we think about that interplay between different categories of assets and making it easier to have that bridge between different modalities of, of telling stories and having people participate in stories. Um, yeah. I guess JD start and then Alex. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so m- now more than ever, right, trans me- studios are kind of adopting a transmedia strategy of kind of converting their IP, whether it's a game, to TV. And we can look at common examples like The Last of Us from last year, Mar- Super Mario Bros., and then Fallout um, was just like a recent release. And you don't have to look very far for that. Um, but oftentimes when we're looking at, like, the challenges with repurposing those assets is the tooling that we're using to kind of see the different contexts that where it's going to be shipped in, whether it's going to be a game that might exist in a 3D environment versus in a 2D environment. Tools that let you kind of switch context from 2D to 3D are going to become more and more essential to view those assets and direct those assets in the way that you want them to tell that story. Um, so the way that we're tackling that specifically at Playbook, in addition to our collaborative features, which, you know, bring more people into that creative process, even if they're maybe not technical, they can contribute to that workflow. The other aspect of it is that we can view our 3D assets and our 3D scenes and our prototypes in a 2D medium on a web, um, on the web browser, or convert them into a XR experience and view and edit our 3D scene in the VR device. So you might have seen at the beginning of our session the trailer of the Stranger Things experience that we um produced in our tool. That's a perfect example of um, an IP that originally started on TV and has now been converted to a successful VR enterprise, VR um, game um, on the MetaQuest headset. So that's an example um, that we're trying to build for and trying to push more of that type of content out. So we're, we're seeing this a lot on um, the studio side. So, you know, high level studios that own a lot of IP are looking to build libraries. Um, they want to build libraries to create those monetization streams for the different types of IP, right? Um, and with that, you know, I think absolutely gaming is just going to speed up when, when all they're remaking every asset right now. If you take a film IP and you are licensing it to a game studio, they're rebuilding everything. Um, so there's a massive amount of sort of, uh, waste and redundancy, if you will, around the content piece, especially. And so there's going to be a lot of, uh, shifts with those things coming together more effectively, especially now that the film industry is adopting uh, game engines, real-time engines, uh, more effectively. And so you're seeing this cross-pollination between all of these industries. Uh, you know, where MOD typically looks at um, in regard to, you know, aiding that sort of storytelling and that functionality and that iteration is uh, things like nerfs and Gaussian splats, right? So photogrammetry was sort of the typical way to take a uh, real-world object place 
human um, and then turn it into 3D. It was very problematic, very hard to do, uh, very time consuming. Um, and ultimately, you know, it made it really challenging for people to do that. And so that's why people have done a lot of modeling, right, um, to, for things that were an issue, um, especially for photogrammetry. So now we're seeing these machine learning algorithms uh, for NERFs and for Gaussian splats that are actually overcoming a lot of those issues in the the real world to 3D kind of conversion. And so it's actually making up the difference um, that a human... Uh, can you just can talk a little bit know. more about what NERFs and Gaussian splats are <laughs> and how they work? So NERF is another, another, another acronym that you need to know. <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, neural radiance fields, um, and they are a way to take imagery, so photos, um, uh, really quick sort of capture around an, Im- an object, uh, and then you can actually run it through the algorithm. It will combine the photos, and it will give you back a 3D asset. Um, Gaussian splats are very similar. They are, it's not less of a 3D uh, real world, or excuse me, less of a 3D sort of object in total. It's more of a plane-based system. And so they work well for different aspects of 3D. So if you're doing plates, Gaussian splats probably make a little bit more sense. If you're doing something where you need to do a close-up of a hero asset um, in in a real world, uh, excuse me, a real-time um, engine, then you're probably going to want to do something like a nerf. And so different, you know, functions for different use cases, but there's also ways to combine them. And so what it really all boils down to is that you're taking uh, you know, 2D imagery, you're converting it into 3D, and it's faster. It's faster, it's easier, it's less problematic than it has ever been before. And so because of that, we're going to start seeing these libraries of real-world assets um, just get built out extensively. Um, and that makes it more accessible for everyone. That makes it more accessible for normal humans to do this rather than someone who's very highly skilled at things like photogrammetry. Yeah, I think that barrier of entry thing is a big thing that's that's going down right we talked about the augmenting piece uh we talked about the collaboration piece right of how we make it easier for people to connect and share their ideas as they're going along the creative process and then i think the the third piece that's coming up is how are we making it easier for people to get started easier for people that are non-technical to still convey their creative vision in some way or the other um we're almost at time but i think i want to kind of quickly touch on there are other kind of ai aspects that are emerging i think with regards to the 3d space um, I think NERFs and, and Gaussian splats are a great way to think about what do 3D assets look like as enabled by AI. Again, a different form of, of, of AI than generative AI. There is stuff happening in the generative 3D space with text to 3D that still needs a bit of a ways to go. But um, there's also stuff that's historic with uh, AI uh, and that has been around for a longer time with procedural or like parametric assets for 3D asset creation. And um, that's getting better. There are tools like Montec that help optimize those assets when they're being generated, um, uh, procedurally generated, not generative AI generated, to clarify. Um, but along that continuum, I think um, we talked a little bit about this transmedia storytelling, right, this interplay between um, formats. Um, assets sometimes need to go beyond that in a format, right? Like So within film, we want an asset to be there. Uh, within gaming, we want the asset to be there and to respond in a certain way, right? We want this responsiveness to experience for film or for virtual worlds. Um, does anyone have some thoughts on like how that's evolving as well as augmented with AI? This like this behavior piece, this kind of simulation piece. And JD, I feel like you might have some thoughts. Yeah. Um, so the big thing about like non-interactive and interactive media and kind of switching between those mediums is um, you want to kind of embody and embed a lot of different properties within those assets. Um, and tooling that lets you kind of easily add a property of this is a gravelable asset in, in VR potentially, or an interactive, um, uh, an asset that could be pressed in a video game um, is very, very key to kind of add that logic. But oftentimes the, the way to do that is through code and no code tooling that lets you kind of quickly and more intuitively and in, 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 in a more way, visually way um, embed those properties within those assets are going to become more and more um, popular to quickly conceptualize and prototype those interactions, especially when you're at the create the first stage of that creative process. You'll still need to go to production tools like Unity and Unreal to kind of ship that final experience, but to communicate that early experience, it's very useful to have those kind of no-code accessible tools. Uh, yeah, the collaboration piece again, uh, I mean, the, the ease of use piece, right? Um, we are unfortunately at time, but I think that hopefully gives a starting point of what are the different areas that we're seeing AI work? And then how is that supporting creators as they go along the process? We're 
we don't have time for Q&A, but we're going to be around here for a little bit longer. So if you have questions, feel free to come up and chat with us. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks, everyone.